Good afternoon, and welcome from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Steve Cook, your host, and I'm happy that you could join us for the second presentation in the IRP webinar series. Today's presenter is Lonnie Berger, Associate Professor of Social Work at the UW and an IRP affiliate. Lonnie will be discussing the parenting roles assumed by low-income men. Before we begin, I would like to express our appreciation for the webinar series support provided by a grant from the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We also hope you'll be able to join us for the next webinar on February 20th, when Catherine Magnuson at the UW School of Social Work will be discussing the role of early childhood interventions in poverty reduction. Look for information on this and future presentations on the IRP webpage and Facebook page or sign up for the IRP emailing list. We should have time for questions after today's presentation. If you would like to submit questions, just locate the dark gray bar near the top of the media site window, click on the ask a question icon, and a new window will open up where you can type your name, email address, and your question, and then hit send. If you have any te technical difficulties with viewing the presentation, please call 1-800-442 4614. And now our presentation. Here's Lonnie. Thanks, Steve. Um, thank you very much, and it's a wonderful opportunity to, to get to share some of this work and discuss some of the work that I and um, many of my colleagues have been doing for a number of years now. Um, and essentially, as Steve said, I'm mostly going to talk about disadvantaged, disadvantaged men in their role as fathers or as parents um, across family structures um, and a little bit um, of how that's changed over time. Um, I should start by acknowledging that this is largely based on a, a review paper that I did with Callie Langton, um, was published last year in the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. Um, and then I'm also adding some, some recent work that's a, a working paper available um, through the University of Wisconsin that's joint with Marcy Carlson. Um, most of this work, or, or, or my pieces of this work was, sub, was um, published by, or was supported by the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development. And I'd like to thank them, but I would also like to say that the opinions are my own and mine alone. Okay. Um, so a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. So I've broken the presentation down into six sections. So the first is, what do fathers do for children? So um, what do they provide in their roles as parents? Um, second, I will um, spend some time um, talking about theoretical perspectives on um, the extent to which fathers invest in children and how this might vary by biological relationships, marriage to children's mothers, um, and co-residence with children. Third, I'll spend some time on the role of social selection, so the extent to which um, characteristics that are associated with the types of families um, uh, men select into or that, that uh, parents form may also be um, associated with, with parental involvement or father involvement. Um, fourth, I'll do a summary on disadvantaged fathers' roles in children's lives, how involved are they across different family structures. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the limitations of existing research and how that's uh, affected what we do and don't know. And finally, I'll um, present some, some conclusions and implications for policy. And then I'll save time to take some questions. Okay. So what do fathers do for children? So I think we need to start with the context that both the forms of families or the structures that families grow up in have changed a lot over time, and so have the expectations or norms around the social role of fathers. So if we think about the forms that children um, uh, uh, grow up in, so the majority of children in the US now will no longer grow up in a stable, two married biological parent home. Um, and this is due to a lot of demographic factors, um, but a large increase in, in um, out-of-wedlock births. So about 40% of all children are born out of wedlock now. If you look at births to mothers under 30, um, it's just over 50%. We also see high rates of parental breakup, although di divorce hasn't been uh, increasing in recent decades. It's leveled off at a high rate. Um, cohabitations are much more likely to break up than divorces, and we've seen an increase, as I said, in, in out-of-wedlock births. Um, so we see much more instability in families. So children are increasingly likely to spend time in single parent families and to exp experience what I'm going to refer to as a social parent or social father, um, which is going to include um, a cohabiting or married partner of a biological parent who's not that child's biological parent. 
so an unrelated biological parent figure who for, for most of what I'm going to talk about today lives with the child. Um, the, so that's one piece. The second piece is at the same time the expectations of the father role have been increasing. So you know, once upon a time the father's role was primarily seen as that of breadwinner and most of the child rearing was expected to, to be done by mothers. Um, that's changed dramatically over the past 50 years and fathers are um, much more expected to take an active role in child rearing, an active role um, um, in, in, in children's development and learning. Um, these two things, uh, the, first the, the increase in the diversity in family forms means that children are going to be exposed to multiple potentially father figures and to different um, types of father figures. So they're going to be exposed to resident and potentially non-resident biological fathers. They also may spend some time living with a social father who's either married or cohabiting with um, their mother. It also means that men are more likely to, to play multiple roles. So they may play multiple roles at the same time, and they may play different, multiple roles over the course of their lifetime. And that may affect their parenting in different contexts. Um, this connects to disadvantage in the sense that Children born to disadvantaged parents, and essentially what I'm talking about um, is lower levels of education, lower levels of, of income, employment, or wages, um, and this overlaps largely with minority status as, um, you know, as, as, as men of color are more likely to be, to be lower income. Um, so children in these families are much more likely to experience family structure transitions, parental breakup, um, out of wedlock births. They're much more likely to spend time um, with a non-resident father or to experience a social father. So, that, so they're disproportionately affected by these family transitions. Um, the other thing is that I think that there's relative agreement that some level of father or father figure involvement is good for kids. So we generally think that whether that if you're a child's um, biological father, whether you live with them or not, um, your input into parenting and your time in, in the child's life um, is important and can have a positive developmental outcomes. And I think there's research to, 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 to support that to some extent. And I think more and more there's also the expectation um, and some research to support that social fathers who live with children, children are going to benefit if they're more involved and if they have better relationships. Um, okay, so what do fathers do? So essentially, Father's contributions um, are, are sort of chalked up to be in the two areas. So one is economic contributions. So for resident fathers, that's essentially earning income and contributing income to the family, some of which gets allocated to children or spent on children. Um, for non-resident fathers, that is um, formal child support, so child support through a court order. But it should also include informal child support and in-kind benefits to the child, either directly or through the mother. So that's giving money on the side, buying things for the child, um, not through a, a, a formal child support agreement. Um, I should say that most of what I'm going to talk about today is on the second piece, which is direct involvement in child rearing. So I'm really going to talk about the parenting piece and much less on the economic um, contributions. So Dan Meyer and Maria Kanchen did um, a child support talk yeah. in the last webinar, and they, they spent time on that. Um, so when we talk about father's involvement in child rearing, we're mostly talking about four areas of, of involvement. So the first is engagement. And so by engagement, we mean um, direct activities with the child, shared experiences with the child. Um, so this is anything from reading to a child, singing to a child, giving a child baths, um, feeding, changing, hugging a child, those kinds of things um, where you're engaged in the same activity. Um, most of the existing research, I should say, has been focused on engagement, although there is some in the other areas of, of parenting, and I'll, I'll talk about what we know about each as we go. Um, the second piece is, is generally referred to as accessibility. Sometimes we think of this um, as secondary caregiving. So essentially this is when a parent is physically present with the child, though not necessarily directly engaged with the child. So they're able to monitor the child, they know what's going on, um, but they're not necessarily doing the same activity. So this would be a circumstance where the father's cooking and the child's playing. Um, the child can easily get the father's attention. The father can um, monitor the child, but they're not doing the same thing. Um, a third piece is responsibility. And this is much more related to child rearing tasks. So um, 
child care, setting up child care, um, setting up doctor's appointments, um, take, perhaps taking the child to these appointments, and making decisions around children's well-being, so around schooling, around medical care, um, perhaps around religion, those kinds of things. Um, and then the last piece is around indirect investments. And so this is sometimes thought of as supporting mothers. Um, so this might be a combination of um, emotional and instrumental support. Um, this might be thought of as co-parenting. Are you on the same page? Do you support each other's rules and routines? Um, those kinds of things. Um, so one thing, I think it's, it's relatively clear that um, disadvantaged men, almost by definition, should have less ability to make or to make at least large um, economic contributions than less advantaged men. Um, I would argue, and I think that the research on low-income households and parenting has shown that they may also have less capacity to invest in these other areas, um, partly because of the, the characteristics that are associated with being, being low-income, but partly because of things like stress and um, other things that play out in, in, in parenting styles. And as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, um, you know, the family structures that disadvantaged and advantaged men are in, on average, afford them less or more time with children. Um, okay. The couple more things I should just point out about the parenting. So most of the research has been on the quantity rather than the quality of parenting. So this is particularly true um, around men. So we're much more um, in tune to how much time fathers spend, how many days a week, how many overnights, if they're non-resident, how much time they spend reading or watching TV or playing sports, much less in um, the quality of those interactions in terms of sensitivity, nurturance, warmth. Um, we've been much better at capturing those things for women than we have for men. Okay. So uh, now I want to talk a little bit about um, the theory about why biology, marriage, and co-residence might influence father involvement. And there's been quite a bit of theory in, in, in multiple disciplines on these family relationships. And essentially, you know, they, they um, come together around three major hypotheses, um, though different disciplines focus on different aspects of family life. So essentially, Sociological theory, economic theory, and sort of and evolutionary theories, evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology, um, point to three things. The first is that biological fathers, on average, will invest more in children than will social fathers. The second is that married fathers, on average, will invest more than unmarried fathers, and that'll carry across. You know, biological father, married fathers should invest more than non-biological, than non-married biological fathers, et cetera. Um, and the third is that resident fathers will invest more than non-resident fathers. Um, and if you put all three of these together, the sort of overarching um, uh, hypothesis has been that biological married resident fathers will invest the most. Um, I want to point out that these hypotheses don't discount that social selection plays a role. And by social selection, I mean um, that there are, are disadvantaged fathers are disproportionately likely to be in social father families, cohabiting father families, and non-resident father families. And they're less likely, on average, to be biological married and resident. Um, they also have fewer economic resources. And so that these background characteristics may be associated with both the type of family they start or end up in, or transition through at some point. Um, and also their levels of investment. And I'll talk about that after I sort of go through each of these, these hypotheses. Okay. So the first hypothesis that biological fathers on average will invest more than social fathers. So if we think about um, the three perspectives, so sociological perspectives are very focused on institutionalization of family types and um, how the influence of all three of these factors, biological ties, residence, and marriage, are going to affect fathers' investments in children. Um, and essentially, the, 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 the main takeaway in terms of biology is that biological fathers have the greatest legal and normative obligations to children. So the expectations are most clear, for, or more clear for biological fathers than for social fathers or stepfathers. Um, there are, are, are more firmly established social norms. 
um, and fathers are going to, biological fathers are going to invest more for these reasons. The evolutionary perspectives are much more explicitly focused on biology and less so on the other factors. And essentially, um, they, they, they um, posit that, that you know, humans have a, an interest in genetic survival. Um, your genes, your legacy is passed on through your children, through your children's success. Investing in children has relatively high costs. So it takes time, it takes money, it takes energy. Um, and because we're interested in genetic survival, um, biological fathers are, or fathers, are more likely to invest in biological children than non-biological children. Um, the economic perspective, much like the sociological perspective, um, is broader and, and, and encompasses all three factors. Um, in terms of biology, there's um, a few major takeaways. So one is that there's an expectation of greater economic altru altruism. So the idea that you get more of an innate inherent benefit by investing in your own children than um, your non-biological children, someone else's children. Um, so that you, economists might say you get more utility. You could think of it as a more of a sort of abstract <laughs> sense of happiness or satisfaction. Um, the second um, is, is around expectations of future returns to investment. So you, you, you may invest in a child because you think, you know, I'm going to have a lifetime relationship with this child. And so it's worth investing for the future. And you may even go as far as to say, you know, the child's going to take care of me um, when I'm older. And those expectations about a long-term relationship, um, a stronger relationship, may be, um, uh, may be greater with regard to biological children than non-biological children. There's less expectation that that relationship is going to be severed, perhaps. Um, and a third, there's, and there's been some empirical research on this, is around perceived endowments of biological and social children. So um, uh, people tend to um, perceive their own children as sort of having better capacities, <laughs> better characteristics than other people's children. And I think for any of us that are parents, you know, sometimes we may even over sort of uh, Over-attribute endowments <laughs> to our own children, um, but so there's an expectation that we, you know, we may invest for those for that reason too. Okay. Um, the second hypothesis that married fathers will invest more than unmarried fathers, all else equal. Um, so sociological perspectives again are, are around the institutional role of the family, um, and that there there are very legal and public aspects of marriage, and that these create institutional strength. Um, so you can look at some of Andy Cherlin's work um, around enforceable trust, um, and uh, Cherlin and Furstenberg's work around you know, parenting as, as a packet, parenting and, and, and marriage as a package deal. Um, so that within marriage, there's, there's a, a, a set of obligations that, that, that people are, are expected to abide by. And this is much less strong and much less clear in cohabiting relationships. Um, Evolutionary perspectives don't explicitly address marriage, but I think that there are plausibly um, some, some implicit takeaways. And to some extent, it's possible that um, marriage is going to confer great, a greater expectation of paternity. Right? So you, you may be much more um, uh, likely to believe or to expect that the children are your own. Um, it also may... Um, may sort of um, mark that a father is more willing to make a long-term investment in this family, in these children. Um, so it may be sort of a marker of, of a commitment to that family unit. Um, the, from an economic perspective, so marriage may um, constitute a much more formal commitment to an entire family, not just a spouse, right? Um, and in that sense, if that's true, it may uh, be associated with greater economic altruism because you're more committed to the family unit. Um, you may get more benefit by investing in children. Um, and at the same time, that you may have higher expectations in marriage relative to cohabitation about the future of that relationship and about returns to that, those investments over time. Um, and that, you know, that the relationship with the child, child or children will be lifelong. Um, so the third hypothesis, that resident fathers will invest more than non-resident fathers. Um, so I think there, there's two pieces to this. So one is, um, you know, partly it's, it, it's uh, you, resident fathers, there's, there's a, a much more um, normative set 
of expectations than in the past um, around father involvement. Um, for non-resident fathers, I think we also expect more involvement, but it's not clear exactly what those levels are. Should you see the child every day? Should it be on weekends? Should it be twice a week? So I think that there's a, a, a much less um, uh, normative set of guidelines for how to operate as a non-resident father than a resident father. And secondly, for non-resident fathers, um, there's much less legally enforceable obligations other than child support. Right? So it, 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 visitation is not so legally enforced. Um, in the same way that child support is. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of the sociological perspective of a family's institution. Um, from an economic perspective, I think first, co-residence simply implies greater access to the father's income because you're sharing his quality of life. So in a sense, um, if you're living in the same house, you're eating the same food to the extent that it's shared, um, you know, by uh, by improving his own well-being, a father may, may well be improving the child's well-being almost mechanically, right? So there's lots of, of public goods. There's some economies of scale. Um, there's also much lower cost to investing in, re in resident than non-resident um, um, children, right? So non-resident children, you need to make transportation arrangements. You may need to set to make arrangements with the mother around time. Um, you may need, you know, you need to schedule time. There may be, um, you know, differences in barriers, work schedules, things like that, um, that may hit non-resident fathers harder. So, so higher transaction costs and more barriers. Um, a third piece is that fathers may invest more because they can monitor their investments more, right? So they can see how children are reacting to their investments. They can make sure that these investments are going to children. You sometimes hear um, in complex families that fathers don't want to, um, make investments because they're not sure it's going to go to their specific child, right? That, it, that the mother controls particularly financial investments. Um, so they have a lot more ability to monitor and to set rules and things like that. Um, and then, you know, finally, the resident fathers, so by living with the father, may create greater expectations, again, around these future returns and, and potentially more, more economic altruism. Okay. Um, so I want to come back to the role of social selection as well. So um, first, the, the timing and context in which men enter into biological fatherhood or social fatherhood um, varies a lot by pre-existing levels of disadvantage in ways um, that are also correlated with investments in children, and, and really in investments in children by both men and women. This isn't particularly men specific. Um, so disadvantaged men are disproportionately likely to become fathers at much younger ages. They're disproportionately likely to be unmarried at the time of birth, to break up with their children's mother, um, to become a social father, um, so to, to meet a woman who already has children. Um, and we also know that, that you know, on average, younger disadvantaged and unmarried fathers are more likely to experience health and mental health problems, um, incarceration, and multi-partner fertility than their, their more advantaged counterparts. Um, they also tend to have children with like women, right? So with women who are also disadvantaged. So um, part of what we're potentially seeing is a selection into both these family structures and levels of um, both ability and, uh, and levels of investment in children. Um, so, uh, so many of these characteristics um, imply that they may have less capacity to invest in children or ability to invest in children, particularly financially. Um, but there's also, as I, as I mentioned before, some spillover into how that may affect parenting. Um, and these same characteristics have um, been shown to, to, to be associated with lower levels of, of father involvement. So um, the other thing that I think is, is worth thinking about, and I'll come back to it at the end, um, so father involvement financially and, and in terms of parenting are positively correlated. So they're they're complements rather than substitutes, right? So it's not that fathers are choosing, I'm either going to spend time or I'm going to spend money. We tend to see fathers doing both or, or more of both or less of both, right? Um, and this may come down to, to capacity. It may be that one is driving the other, although uh, research hasn't shown a clear direction um, uh, of which is driving which. Um, and it may be that 
that um, it's a marker of more or less motivated fathers. And I'll come back to this a little bit at the end and what it means for, for policy. Um, I do want to say that adjusting for as many of these social selection factors as we can that we can observe tends to account for a, a pretty big portion of the differences um, in, in father involvement across family types, but doesn't explain those whole differences. So even when we say, let's look at men of a similar income, let's look at men with similar levels of health, um, these other background characteristics, we still see differences um, by these three factors across family types. Um, I also, you know, and I'll come back to this at the end too, but there's been um, a lot of work by Sarah McClanahan and some of her colleagues um, talking about how this, uh, she, this idea of diverging destinies, that this differential selection into fertility and family formation patterns may have major implications for intergenerational transmission of poverty and inequality. So essentially um, what we're seeing is um, less advantaged individuals having children earlier, having children in less stable context and more likely to break up, um, all of which are associated with fewer additional resources for children going forward. So, and that could have um, big policy implications. Okay, so I'll show you um, a few differences in, in, in fathering and family formation. Um, what I'm using here is just, did you have a child before age 25 or after age 25? I've tried this with um, with different age cutoffs, the basic pattern's the same, the, the size matters a little bit. And so we can think of this as younger and older births. Um, this is from the National Survey of Family Growth um, in 2002. Um, and essentially what we'll see is, you know, 83% of, so these are men between 25 and 44, 83% um, of those who became a father after age 25 were married at the time of their first birth. 52% of those who became a father before age 25 were married at the first birth. So, you know, 47, 48% were not married if they had a child before age 25 compared to 17% who had a child um, after age 25. So a big difference in sort of this selection into marriage into family structure. Um, if we look at the, the fourth row on the table, so really big difference in multi-partner fertility. So the men in the sample, um, who had their first child after age, age 25, only 5% of them um, had currently children with multiple partners versus 29% of the men who had a child before age 25. I want to caution that that 5% is an underestimate, right? So, right, so these are men who, um, uh, so they've been in the risk pool for a shorter period of time and their fertility is also not finished, right? So that would probably increase. Um, but there's a, this is just a sort of huge difference if, at a point in time. Um, we also see that um, white men are, 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 are more likely to have their, their child after age 25, whereas black and Hispanic men are more likely to have one uh, before age 25. If we go to education, um, we see it the same general pattern. So if we look at the first column, the less than high school, um, of those who are less than high school, 25% became a father after age 25, 54% became a father um, before age 25. This doesn't add up to 100% because some of them haven't become a father yet. Um, if we look at college degree or more, we see a really, we see, you know, a, a clear reversal so that, that the college degree or more, um, you're much more likely to become a father later. We see a very similar pattern with income. The higher your income to poverty rate, um, the more likely you are to, to, to have become a father later. So I want to say that these are current education and current income. So part of this is reflecting the age at which you had a child and your education or income then. Part of it's reflecting what happened since, right? And having a child is likely to affect your, your future trajectory in those days. Okay. Um, so let's turn to sort of the main piece of the talk. So what do we know about father's involvement with children? Um, so first I want to lay out a few of the overall um, positive and negative antecedents, so what's correlated with more or less involvement, and then I will talk about um, what we know of disadvantaged versus non-disadvantaged men and, and um, by family structure. Okay. So positive antecedents, so part of these are the characteristics that are associated with being advantaged or disadvantaged. So higher human capital, greater levels of education, um, 
greater status occupations, those kinds of things are associated with more father involvement and that is true um, both within um, co-residence and marriage and, and outside of, of, of marriage and co-residence. Um, experiences with, with men's own fathers or male role models have been shown to be important. Um, and, we also, and we know that you know, on average disadvantaged men were less likely to have a, a co-resident father figure and, and, and close relationships with father figures. Um, though often there are other male role models. Um, a third piece is this identification with a fathering role, so sort of how you view yourself as a father and the importance of being a father and, and being uh, there for your child and, and developmentally supporting your child. Um, I think this is, that's also you know, somewhat mixed with these experiences of, of your own father and the uh, male role models. Um, it's been shown a factor. Um, relationship quality, so both your relationship with the mother, whether you're um, together or not, and to some extent relationship with mother's other relatives because they can facilitate or sometimes um, um, put barriers up to you to you spend time with the child, um, particularly if you're non-resident. So negative antecedents overall are um, psychosocial problems, so these are mental health, health, um, substance abuse issues, incarceration, right? So clearly <laughs> a mechanical effect at least of seeing children um, in person. Um, maternal and paternal repartnering, so when either moms or dads find a new partner or have new children, um, father involvement tends to drop off, the amount of time they spend with the children. Child support tends to decrease too, but not as steeply, not um, nowhere near as steeply. And, and I think part of that has to do with if there's a support, or if there's a, a, an enforcement system right. for child support. <laughs> if there's not um, necessarily, or there's not for, for visitation. Um, uh, maternal and family member gatekeeping, so um, you know whether the mom, and particularly if she lives with family members, want to facilitate or um, um, you know visitation and time with kid with the father or not, um, and that you know partly also goes back to those relationships. Um, child health and disability. So there's some research showing that um, you know kids who have big, more health problems and more disability fathers tend to to, to visit less, to spend less time with. Um, and then I think one that, that hasn't received as much attention, but um, some recent work by Bob Bill Marsiglio and, and Kevin Roy looks at sort of these periods of unstable living arrangements for fathers. And if, you know, if fathers are crashing on people's couches or, or um, moving around in their living arrangements, um, it's, it's harder to have a regular visitation, a regular place to spend time with your children. And so um, I think that, that, that there's some, um, some possibility there. Um, I do want to say, so net of these factors to the extent that um, uh, studies have controlled for these factors, they still tend to find um, unexplained variation, or variation that's not explained by these factors, by family structures and, and, and statuses um, in father involvement. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the father involvement by resident biological and social fathers, then I'll talk about non-resident biological fathers. Um, and I'm going to separate them into two groups. So I'll separate them into non-incarcerated and incarcerated, right? So very different um, opportunities to, to be involved. Um, but I think that we often forget about the incarcerated group, and I think it's an important group um, that, we, that we need to talk about. Um, so, you know, most resident fathers, whether biological or social, spend a considerable amount of time with kids engage with children in you know, considerable amount of activities on a regular basis. And part of that um, goes back to transactions, costs, et cetera. It's easy. They're there. You're both there. Um, they're, they're, it's much less difficult to, to, to spend time. Um, two points I want to make, and this is I'm not specific to a disadvantaged men. This is across the board. Um, they spend less time than mothers do with children um, first. Uh, roughly they spend a third less time um, than mothers spend with children. Um, second, they, the, most men do participate in cognitively stimulating activities, reading, teaching, um, helping with homework, monitoring, disciplining, and rule setting. They do much less of that than do mothers on average. Um, so they spend a lot more time in play, in sports, in watching TV and video games, um, sort of more leisure activities. So there's some differences um, on average in the types of activities. Um, 
if we look at sort of general population samples and, and particularly divorced or um, middle and higher, middle SES families, um, the evidence is relatively clear that married co-resident biological fathers are more involved than all other types of fathers. Right? These are also the most advantaged fathers by far. They're the highest incomes, they're the, the highest level of education on average. Um, the, if we look um, particularly within marriage, comparing biological and social fathers, most of the prior work on, on you know, middle income or population samples um, suggests that married biological fathers are more involved in, than married social fathers. On average, they tend to do more activities with children. Um, there's less research on warmth and positive feelings and supportiveness. Um, as well as sort of monitoring controlling behaviors, but they tend to um, uh, fare better on those measures as well. Um, if we look at married versus cohabiting biological fathers, so within biological fathers, um, for the most of the research suggests greater involvement among the married biological fathers than the cohabiting. Um, and again, these, they're more advantaged. Um, but at the same time, the, the married biological fathers are, are considerably more likely to spank the children than, than our um, cohabiting biological fathers. So this may go along with more engagement and, and, and more involvement. This may um, have something to do with sort of more conservative um, approaches to marriage and also um, discipline. So uh, it's not exactly clear what that's about. Um, if we look at differences between cohabiting biological and cohabiting social fathers, I think there's a less consistent and less clear pattern. Um, so now I want to turn to some recent work specifically around disadvantaged men and, or disadvantaged resident biological fathers. And there's a somewhat different pattern here um, coming out of some work that I've done with a number of colleagues, some work that Christina um, Gibson Davis has done. And essentially, data use, or work using the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study, which is, um, more, or, uh, is a relatively disadvantaged fam sample. So um, it's urban families that were disproportionately likely to have an adult wedlock birth. Um, it's uh, disproportionately a, a lower income, um, et cetera. And these work from this, stu these, this study is, is actually showing that in many cases, social fathers are equally or in, on some measures more involved with children, so these are particularly married social fathers, than are married biological fathers. So these are the biological fathers, these are not the exes, these are not their non-resident. These are biological fathers who by age five are still living with the child and married to the child's mother, um, compared to mothers who have remarried or married a, a, a social father. Um, and essentially, you know, the social fathers do as well, or the married social fathers, on activity engagement, co-parenting and shared responsibility for, for parenting. Um, they also spank less than the married biological father families. Um, this is not necessarily true if we turn to, to cohabiting biological, or cohabiting social fathers. And I'll show you a little bit of data in, in just a second. Um, I think this may suggest, you know, two things. So one may be um, that among disadvantaged populations, um, these differences between married biological and social father families um, are much smaller, and there may be uh, you know, greater levels of investment or, or more similar levels of investment across family types. Um, it also may be that mothers who choose to repartner particularly into marriage, um, particularly low-income mothers, are, are looking for men or are doing so with men who demonstrate that they're involved with their children. Um, on this sort of selection into repartnering, Sharon Boztek and, and Sarah McClanahan and Marcy Carlson have done some work showing that um, women who repartner tend to do so with men who um, have what they call a higher or greater economic capacity, so greater incomes, um, less criminal justice involvement, higher education, things like that. Okay. Um, um, so if I look at non-resident, non-incarcerated biological father involvement. So most kids so, uh, so who don't live with their fathers, and their father's not in jail, um, see their father, so about 60%, but a large, in a given year, but a large proportion, about 40%, don't see their father in a given year. Um, those who have contact 
average about 69 days per year, so a little bit more than one day a week. Um, there's very large variation, um, and you know, there's and there's also this sort of um, big big proportion of kids who don't see their kid, their father in a year, or see him relatively frequently. Um, I'm giving you averages, but I think it's really important to think about that there's variation across levels. There's also variation over time. Um, in terms of, of advantage versus disadvantage, so on average, uh, younger and less advantaged fathers see their children less and are less involved with their, with their children. Um, at the same time, the, the um, controlling for sort of levels of disadvantage the differences between never married and divorced fathers aren't huge. They're slightly less for the, the never married fathers, um, but they're not huge. The, in both family types, contact tends to decrease over time. In both family types, contact tends to decrease when mothers or fathers repartner or have new children. Um, and I think that the, the thing to remember is that the, the composition of these families changes. So the lower, the more disadvantaged families are more likely to break up. They're more likely to have been cohabiting to begin with and things like that. So that, that over time, these, these um, differences may multiply or may be larger. Yeah. Um, again, I just sort of you know, wanted to, to remind us that involvement tends to be packaged with formal and informal cash or income support. Um, and particularly around um, non-resident dads, activities tend to be even more so recreational or leisure oriented than, than instrumental. Um, and part of that may be that you spend less time with the child and you want to make that good time, not <laughs> disciplining time and not um, um, you know, sort of work time um, for the child. Okay, so this is some um, data from the uh, working paper that Marcy Carlson and I did. Um, and essentially what I'm showing you is six family types the, and the, the sort of gray um, striped bars are family, average family income in each family type. Um, the black bars on the middle are mother's involvement, overall involvement. The sort of dark or, or the solid gray on the top is biological father involvement. The white is, is social father involvement. So the first two are married and cohabiting um, uh, mother and biological father families. So one thing to notice is the married Mother, bio father, biological father families have much higher income than all of the other family types. Second thing to notice is this is uh, with the fragile families data. This is at age five. Not a big difference in the the overall involvement or father involvement between married and cohabiting. If we go to the social fathers, there's a very big difference. So two things are so that the first thing to notice is there's uh, in the mother and, and social father married, there is a very high level of participation bigger than the mother, both of the mother and biological father family, um, or, so more, more involvement, um, and much bigger than the cohabiting social father families. Second thing to notice is um, in those family types, there's very little involvement on average by, um, by the biological father family. Um, and then it, we see in the, the, the last two bars are um, when the mother and biological father are dating and the mother is um, single and not dating the father. And so we kind of see what we might expect there. Okay. Um, so I wanted to, to break it down by just two types of activities, sort of what we might think of as, as very cognitively stimulating and less so. So we look at reading and, and TV video watching. Um, so what we see essentially is, you know, biological father families, um, particularly the marrieds, do a relatively similar, the dads do a similar level of both with the children. Um, for cohabiting biological father families and for both types of social father families, um, we see more, um, though not grossly, but more um, TV watching than reading. So sort of more in line with that pattern of, of the dads um, doing little. Um, and again, in both sets of activities, the, 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 social, the married social fathers are, are engaging in, in a greater period, of, uh, greater amount than the, the biological fathers. Okay. Um, so this shows, so the levels of, of biological father involvement over time at ages one, three, and five by changes in family structure. 
Um, the big thing, so the, the, the cluster of bars up at the top are where the mother and father were living together at age one. Um, the two to lines at the bottom are where they were not. Um, the big uh, takeaway, so the one line, the orange line that increases a little, it's more or less flat, um, are where the father um, moved out and then moved back in. You don't see a, a, a huge difference there. <laughs> um, so, I'm sorry, no, no, no. This was a single mother at age one and then the father moved in by age five. Um, but it's relatively flat, but these were probably men that were around and, and involved with the child at age one anyway. Um, we see relatively flat, um, but a small decrease in the, 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 the blue line with the diamonds on top, and these are families that were mother and father the whole time. Um, we see huge decreases in biological father involvement when parents break up, and particularly when, when moms repartner. So essentially what's happening um, is there's, you know, the, the, it's not exactly clear what comes first, um, whether the father involvement decreases then the mom repartners or vice versa, um, but we see these big differences. So I also wanted to just talk about, these are again point in time estimates in the National Survey of Families and Growth by this age, looking at sort of disadvantage. Um, so these are resident biological fathers, so these are the dads who live with a child. Um, the left hand side is um, before the, the fathers before age 25, who had a their first child before age 25. Um, the right-hand side is after age 25. Gray bar is um, children who are currently under age 5, and the red bar is currently children who are currently 5 or 18. Um, what we essentially see is the fathers who had children at an older age are currently going to be more involved with the, with the children. Um, so again, suggesting that the more advantaged fathers are likely to, to be more involved over time. Um, if we look at social father involvement, so here we're looking at men who became social fathers at age 25, uh, so it wasn't clear what to sort of set the benchmark in because they didn't have a kid, um, but we see the same kind of pattern. If they become a social father at an older age, um, they, they um, are, spend more time involved with children. Um, for non-resident fathers, this first bar is a um, uh, 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 number of visits with the child in the last year. Um, we see the biggest difference around the number of visits um, and less of a difference around the activities sort of conditional on visiting. So, um, okay. So uh, I also want to make a point or, or a couple of points about non-resident um, incarcerated bi biological father involvement. Um, this is a really important subset of disadvantaged fathers. We don't know much about their ongoing involvement, um, but, you know, it's going to affect Two, you know, a little over 2% of all children, 2.3% of all children have an incarcerated parent. Um, for black children, they're seven and a half times more likely than white children to have an incarcerated parent. Um, on average, these are relatively long absences. So if you get, um, uh, you know, on average, if you're sentenced to state or federal custody, it's four to nine years. So these aren't, you know, if you get to that level, these aren't real short um, things. These are situations where the father has very little control over the contact. So essentially it's up to other people to make it happen. Um, so maternal gatekeeping or the quality of the relationship can be very important here. So if they have a good relationship, the mother may really want to make it happen. Um, if they don't, um, you know, the, the mother can much more easily, you know, the father doesn't have a lot of recourse if the mother doesn't take the child to visit and those kinds of things. Um, the visitation also has considerable economic costs for mothers often. So often, you know, the, 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 the institution is far from their home. So it may, there's transportation costs, it may require taking days off of work or school, those kinds of things. Um, and distance is a very strong predictor of contact. So most contact by, by inmates with their children um, is by mail, right? And we might think of, you know, the, there may be very different quality implications there. Um, on average, about 30 to 40 percent report some kind of weekly contact um, and 23 percent monthly contact, an additional 23 percent. Um, but almost a quarter, between a fifth and a quarter, um, report no contact and about 60 percent report no visits. Okay. Um, so I actually think in the essence of time I'm going to skip the limitations of existing research, but we can okay. talk about that in, um, in, in some of the questions to get to the policy. So. Conclusions. Um, selection into type and timing of fertility and family formation is important and has 
implications for intergenerational transmission of, of poverty and inequality. Um, so married biological fathers are both more advantaged, they're more involved um, than other father types, and they're likely to have their children later, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a selection into it, and those contexts um, also uh, do, you know, are, are more conducive to both economic um, investments and, 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 um, and, and parenting investments. So there may be a, a bit of a cyclical nature there. Um, it's also possible that there is less social capital or less efficient transfer of human capital than other family types. So um, is, it, it, kin networks may not be as strong. So um, a social fathers, particularly coach, social fathers, um, um, uh, cohabiting social fathers family may, um, may have lesser connection to the child. There may be less um, networking in those ways. It may also be that the same activities done with a biological or social father may influence the child very differently based on the, the context. Um, second thing, um, it may be that the resident biological social father gap in involvement um, is less pronounced among disadvantaged families than, than more advanced families, particularly in the context of marriage. Um, and so one thing we may want to think about is the extent to which we should start to see um, social fathers as, as a potential resource in disadvantaged families. Though I do want to caution that I think that there is a lot of um, variation. And I, I've done some other work even with the same sample that shows um, social families are more likely to get involved with child protective services. So there may well also be um, a subset. So on average, they may look pretty good, but there may be an, a, a subset. Um, nonetheless, I think um, existing policy initiatives and father initiatives want to think about the roles of social fathers. Um, and that sort of leads into this next point about family complexity. I think we, you know, to the extent that we want to promote fatherhood, um, father involvement, healthy relationships, we really need to think about that it's not just a current couple and their joint children anymore, particularly among disadvantaged families. Fathers are playing multiple roles at a given point in time, and over time, children are exposed to multiple potential father figures. Um, and we want to think about that. The other question is, you know, should policies and programs focus on instrumental, developmentally supportive uh, you know, um, involvement or just getting fathers to see their kids? Mm -hmm. And I think just getting the fathers to see their kids is a big thing. But we also, you know, we do home visiting programs and things um, that are much more oriented around modeling for mothers and things like that. And we may want to do more of that. Um, the two last things I'll say is for non-resident fathers, we may also want to have a conversation. Do we want to encourage all fathers to see their children under all circumstances? Or do we want to think about substance abuse problems, domestic violence problems, um, and, 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 you know, sort of uh, look at the different um, uh, uh, circumstances under which it may or may not benefit children. And I don't think we have honest conversations about that as enough. Um, finally, uh, well, two, two quick things. Uh, one, employment, child support, and father involvement are all interrelated. And I think that um, if we want to improve child, uh, father involvement, we want to tackle all three. Yeah. Um, and there's a recent national demonstration project that the Institute for Research on Poverty is actually evaluating um, that's going to get at this. Um, and lastly, we need to think about how much we want to promote father involvement among incarcerated men and how to do it if we do want to do that, and yeah. whether it's through video conferencing or what. Yeah. So thanks very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, well, thank you, Ani. Very interesting. Uh, we now have time for a few questions. Uh, so remember, if you want to submit a question, to locate the dark gray bar near the top of the media site window and click on Ask a Question icon. Window will open up, and you can type your name, email address, and the question, and then you hit send, and it'll show up on my screen here, and I'll ask Lonnie. Uh, so um, we already have a couple questions that have come in, so we'll start off with those. Um, so you know, I wanted to get back to this point about uh, the disadvantaged stepfathers and, um, and so social fathers, uh, especially married social fathers. Uh, being more involved in the parenting than than even some of these resident biological fathers, um, you know, obviously selection is playing a role there. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about what's going on there. So I think one thing that's interesting is that we see it much um, much more uh, among the married families and not so much the the cohabiting social father families, right? And I think that one of that may be a signal that 
it is largely, or at least um, partially, a selection story. So it may well be that you know, the men who have more taste for parenting or are more um, interested and involved already have better relationships to the dating with the mother's children are more likely to marry them. Right. It may also be that mothers are more likely to marry guys who are demonstrating that they're being good to their kids. Right. I want to make a couple of other um, points. One is um, that the, these are young relationships in that fragile family study, right? So these kids are only five years old. By definition, the, fa the social fathers can't have been, th been there more than five years, right? So I don't know, one of the things we have to monitor, and we're looking at the children, the age nine data is out now, is do these relationships last? Does the quality of parenting keep up? Is it a honeymoon phase? Right. Um, so I think that I wouldn't take too much from that, um, you know, across the board um, without more evidence. But I think it's worth looking into. Um, I think that, you know, it's a good sign that the moms perceive the fathers as uh, social fathers as being good to their kids. Yeah. Um, like I said, oh, I've done some other research that shows that there's also a, a higher likelihood of, of child protective services involvement. So there's going to be, um, so there's variation there. <laughs> so, is, is, um, so, so, you know, one of the things I wonder about is how much, so some of those social fathers are also biological, you know, will have become biological fathers with right. their mother. And so, you know, you would expect that even within that group of social fathers, yeah. those that have then gone on to have a biological child with the mother now well, maybe maybe you even have better relationships. Yeah. So there's know. this sort of question: Is there spillover, positive spillover, yeah. or negative? Right. So do you uh, parent both both kids the same? And you know, and if you want to invest a lot in your biological child, you also invest in the other, or do you sort of concentrate on the one? My um, overall take on the the relatively limited uh, literature on this is that if there's spillover, it tends to be positive. Yeah. So it tends to yeah. be that you're more li you're yeah. you know. Yeah. The, not, you know, the other question that comes to mind then related to that is, is even if these, the social fathers that we observe are doing a fairly good job here, um, you know, given the selectivity, uh, you know, how big of a pool of potential social fathers are there out there? So, you know, does this really pose a, a, a solution to, you know, some larger social problem? Yeah, so I, I would not advocate it as a solution. <laughs> so, you know, so, um, but I think for families that are selecting into repartnering, yeah. that, w that we should certainly try to support them and give them the best chance they, you know, that we can. Mm -hmm. I also think we really need to look into this, um, the, the sort of piece about the, 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 the meaning and sort of the influence of the father's behaviors and do they mean the same or do they, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, like yield the same returns in terms of child development um, from, from both types of fathers. Because it may well be that you know, as a social father, you have to work a lot harder to get to the same place with a child. So, um, so you know, I wonder, you s sort of started to talk about that a little bit in that response was uh, uh, this question of sort of what policies might there be that can en encourage uh, father involvement in general, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's with social fathers or, or biological fathers right. um, among the disadvantaged population. So I think that, you know, so the, there's this correlation between the income and, or not income, the, the uh, child support, economic support and involvement, uh, income too. But, um, and I think that, you know, we really need to support the ability of men to be able to contribute financially. And I think that that could play a role in, a, in multiple different ways, right? So it may encourage men um, to, to spend time with their kids because they want to, you know, they want to see these investments. They want to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, see what, 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 what the money's doing. I think more likely or more importantly, it may make the mothers more likely to want the dad around because they see he's contributing financially as well. It may help their relationship be better. I think it may help the fathers kind of feel good about themselves. I can take my kid out. I can buy him shoes. I can, um, or, you know, I'm paying my child support. Um, to that end, I think that there's a couple things. Um, one, um, to the you know, child support pass-throughs. So states now can, for women who are, are, are um, involved in the, the TANF system, the welfare system, can pass through their whole 
child support. As far as I know, most states are not doing that. Um, <laughs> I think by doing that, so Wisconsin did a, a big experiment and had um, many positive outcomes, I think. Right. And I think by doing that, um, the fathers feel like the money's going to the children. The mothers feel like they're benefiting from the child support. Um, and that may encourage some relationships. I think, um, you know, I think we ought to think about tax policy. So, you know, earned income tax. So as far as I, I know, and I'm quite sure I'm right on this, child support is almost irrelevant or is irrelevant to the tax system, right? So, you know, so not only a father can't write it off, but generally, if the mother is the primary um, uh, resident parent, she's going to take their earned income tax credit if she's working. Okay. The father's not going to, he's, so he's going to pay for part of the child, but he's not going to reap any of the tax benefits of the child. And I think some of those kinds of things may encourage, um, you know, may encourage some more financial involvement. Yeah. Um, uh, here's a question about uh, the sex of the children. So. Uh, has there been any research that sort of looks at the different levels of involvement between fathers and their male children and their female children? Yeah. Um, so I don't think that there's real strong differences. I mean, there have been some things that show that fathers are a little bit more involved with boys. Um, that tends to be um, a little bit more pronounced, um, you know, through adolescence. Like as boys get older, they often um, or sometimes. Uh, connect more with their biological fathers. Um, I think there are you know, some small differences. I don't think it's a huge, huge factor. Would be okay. my, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, back to this idea of how to uh, maybe support involvement for incarcerated fathers. Um, are you familiar with any programs of you know, video conferencing or yeah. Uh, things that help encourage that uh, level of involvement? Yeah, so I don't know the names <laughs> of any <laughs> offhand, um, but I know that there are some programs. So, what, so it's sometimes hard to get the different systems to talk to each other. So sometimes it's, you know, you want to coordinate between um, uh, you know, criminal justice, um, uh, child support, and sometimes child welfare. Right. Um, so I know that several states have pilots. Um, you may know some of them. To do some I'm of this, sort of vaguely familiar right. with some of these. Yeah. Um, there are also some projects around some child support arrears forgiveness, um, some experiments around yeah. or limiting while yeah. while fathers are in jail. Yeah. Um, and I've actually, I recently saw some kind of documentary that partly had, <laughs> uh, that partly you know that was showed them sort of the the parents doing visitation from from video conferencing, and I can't right. remember what state it was in. Um, I don't think it's a real strong or prominent move, and I don't think. Um, We've settled on how do we do this for how many fathers, how regularly is there a systematic way to approach it. But I think people are interested. Yeah. You know. And, you know, obviously the incarceration has important effects of involvement while the father is incarcerated. Right. But then it has these, you know, even after the father has been released, you know, these long, long standing kind right. of issues about, okay, they haven't had this involvement for a while. How do you reattach to the children? Right. How do you, you know, and the incarceration is sort of this bad marker for the father. It has all these other bad right. outcomes yeah, that exactly. can relate on Right, And I think that's what partly drove the, some of the child support arrears pieces, that you're going to come out of, of, of jail when you couldn't work with this huge debt, too. Um, that may you know, affect your ability, to, right. your likeliness, to, uh, likelihood of paying later, your involvement, et cetera. So I think that part of it is thinking about continuity of relationships when fathers come, come out. Um, so you, you mentioned a couple times kind of the relationship between uh, between, this will be our final question, uh, the relationship between um, uh, the level of involvement and uh, social fathers, especially in social and child protection issues, child maltreatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, is it really kind of this relationship between the, the type of fatherhood and, and other maltreatment? Are there uh, just a general relationship between Sort of involvement has a positive relationship to maltreatment just because there's exposure there right. between. Right. So the I child think the exposure is part of it, um, and some of the stuff we looked at, what you know, the um, essentially, you know, being related to none of the children in the household is more of a risk than being related to some, right, yeah. or all. Yeah. Um, but the other thing with child protection is. For the most part, child protection is now starting to think about non-resident fathers as biological fathers as resources when children are potentially going to care. You know, they're getting, yeah. trying to get fathers involved. 
we think often the interventions include mothers, um, uh, husbands, if it's a social father, right. stepfathers. Um, much less around the cohabiting partners, unless they're part of the allegation. But we don't do a lot around um, making them part of the solution. And I think, you know, for some of these families, we could, we should, in one way or another, engage these other men that that, that children are going to be exposed to, particularly if they're, you know, there on a relatively consistent basis. Um, and I think that we need to sort of suspend judgment for a little while until we assess a family for that family and not make an assumption either way about all social fathers. Okay. Right. Good. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you to Lonnie and to all of those watching. Uh, we will have a recording of today's webinar, webinar up on our, the IRP website uh, within about a week. Uh, so uh, one last reminder, we encourage you to join us for our next webinar, which is on February 20th. Uh, Catherine Magison uh, will be discussing the role of early childhood interventions in poverty reduction. And those of, uh, those of you on the mailing list uh, will receive an email about this in early February. Uh, so thank you and goodbye. <laughs>